Hello, this is Susan Bird, and you are listening to the Curated Conversations podcast. In this series, East Meets West and Vice Versa, we're exploring the new conversations taking place in and between Asia and the West on a variety of subjects. With me today is Axel Herzhauser, who is Vice President Commercial for Asia Pacific for a company called Teleplan, which is a fascinating niche aftermarket business, basically in the consumer electronics area. It's fascinating uh, business that he's gone into fairly recently. And Axel has more than 16 years of experience in the logistics and supply chain industry, with 10 of those having been spent in Asia and uh, the rest elsewhere. He began his career in Germany before he came to Asia and established himself as a sought-after business executive, specifically as a supply chain wizard. Axel earned his BA from the University of Cooperative Education in Mannheim, Germany, and is currently based in Singapore. He speaks English, German, and says he also can command basic Cantonese. And because he has lived and worked in both Europe and Asia, he has an informed view of developments on both sides of the world. He's joining us today from Singapore. Welcome to Curated Conversations, Axel. Thank you, Susan. So when we talk about conversations taking place in and between Asia and the West, what, what does that bring to mind for you? What does that mean? It brings to mind, first of all, opportunities, I would say. I think a lot of opportunities that I would say both both, both worlds uh, connect. Uh, it also comes along with, uh, with challenges. Uh, and for me personally as well, also a whole lot of experiences because I spent most of my career and my professional life here out here in Asia. And the reason why I was out here, uh, while I'm out, while, why I'm out here, is predominantly to to basically connect the dots, to connect the cultures, connect the two world, worlds, which again have uh, bring a lot of opportunities. They bring challenges. Uh, and uh, what personally excites me the most about it is being here in Asia. It's something that uh, there is every day is a new day. It's, every day brings new excitement, brings new challenges, and that's that's an, that, that's certainly an area that that uh, excites me most. That's great. So um, how has the dialogue, since you've been there a decade, how has the dialogue shifted during the last decade? I think, I think the way the dialogue between East and West has shifted is because it's is mainly uh, based on a, clearly a, a better understanding between East and West. When I came out here a bit over 10 years ago, uh, I would say there was there was uh, relative there was little understanding in in the societies in, in 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 the West, meaning in Western Europe or in North America. There was also not too much knowledge here in Asia about in what the societies in Europe represent. So I I think uh, the world has shifted to a point where there is a lot more visibility. There is a lot better understanding nowadays uh, uh, of what the other side is doing culturally. There is a lot more. There's a lot of interest, basically, in what's happening. I go, I, I go, to, I go to North America or go to Europe nowadays. There's a, people are well better informed about what's happening in Asia. If I go through Asia, it's exactly the same the other way around. Really? So, would you say that the Western understanding of Asia has really developed over the last decade? People in this part of the world really get it more than they did then. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say they fully get it. There certainly is more interest around it, so it, it goes it goes beyond stereotypes that probably existed ten years back, and that all starts with basic things about food. Uh, people ask a lot, asked in the past, you know, apparently all the strange foods that people would eat in Asia, which I would say in ninety five percent of the cases it's a stereotype. There is a lot of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, a stereotype also here in Asia, where for example, if you go through Asia about uh, um, perceptions people have about people in Europe and in North America, and that has changed. I mean, some of them are still there. Some of them are actually meant to, uh, very often and it's joking in a funny way, but I think there's a much clearer understanding today than there was back then. I mean, if you look at, at travel statistics, more people than ever are probably traveling between the two worlds right now. So that just basically helps to improve a cultural understanding uh, between both parts. I think you're so right about that. When you have a face-to-face -face experience in another country, it it, uh, it really forms and informs your your view of that place for, for for the future. So let's talk about what's on the mind of many people who have an interest in Asia, and that is the 
current downturn in the Chinese economy or slowdown, if you prefer. What's happening and how is that impact being felt both in China and in Singapore since you're you're there? I know you travel a great deal all over all over the place, but you might be able to tell us what's going on with this and what's the what's the impact? So what we're seeing right now is, is uh, I would I wouldn't necessarily call it a downturn. I mean I mean if if we look at economic growth rates that that Asia has today, and, and looking at Singapore and looking at China, you know GDP growth rates are still above, especially for China, above six percent at the moment, which is which is a which is a decline compared to years back, where it was uh, where, where you know China uh, enjoyed double digit growth uh, year by year. Uh, but what's happening right now is uh, the markets are probably becoming a little, coming, becoming more sophisticated. I think uh, China had a uh, had a very very strong era over over a decade, basically where it was the manufacturing house of the world, basically meaning it provided cheaper labor, it provided uh, it provided uh, market opportunities also for overseas companies to invest into in the China consumer markets. Now that has shifted slightly, and it, and, and it'll continue to shift because of various reasons demographic reasons that China is facing. Uh, it's, all, it's also uh, due to the fact that wealth uh, has, has shifted in China overall. So there is a, there is a, there is a very fast-growing middle class in China that is dominating a lot of these, the, these uh, reasons why we see probably less growth today than we did uh, years back. It also has to do, in particular, with foreign investment that's coming into that's coming into Asia or in China, in particular. So we have we we saw years back, probably 10, 15 years ago, a lot of foreign investment flowing into China. Right now, we see the opposite. We we see we see the Chinese buying big international conglomerates, in, 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 uh, especially from North America. So it's it, it's some sort of a reverse uh, situation that we're encountering right now, and that that possibly can all contribute it to the change of the situation that we're facing today. So how is that impact being felt in Singapore? I know that Singapore relies on China for a great deal, so it has strong ties to China. Uh, is there is there a, a felt impact from this slowing down? There certainly is. There, uh, Singapore is facing an impact, but it's not as visible as it possibly is in China. I mean, Singapore is not by far not as... as as, uh, as much in the radar as, as, as China, Singapore is a is a, a relatively small economy. It's a small country. It's a city state with uh, uh, approximately five million people. China is a country of about 1.4 billion people. So we're not really comparing apples with apples. Now, if we look at the environment in Singapore, how do we how do we see the the changes at the moment? Uh, from an economic standpoint, you see a lot of uh, international companies that have been attracted to come into Singapore. Many of them have set up their, their regional offices, a lot of them are actually also their global offices, uh, meaning they would overlook the China market, Asia Pacific overall, but also overlooking the China market. So we do see some changes there right now where some of, some of uh, these big corporations are actually downsizing their, uh, uh, their regional offices here. We see we see a bit of a shift in in, in strategy as well. So for some companies, uh, China itself is a region by itself. So basically, whatever we've seen in the past, where a lot of companies were looking at Asia, they were looking at Asia Pacific, excluding uh, Japan. We see we saw that a lot in the banking sector. We see a lot of that in the corporate world today, where companies look at Asia Pacific, excluding China, because they think China is simply too big or big enough to represent a region by itself. That's interesting. Now, that uh, that's helpful around the economic piece of this. What about the individuals that are involved? We know that people born in the last 30 years, certainly in China, 30 years ago or less, have been living in a country where growth has been exponential. So that growth is suddenly, as you say, still respectable, but it has slowed. Is the mood there any different, especially among this middle class, which has probably not inappropriately thought this would go on for a long, long time. Are they frustrated? Is there any, can yes. you see that? Um, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it frustration, but there certainly is a shift and there's a very, very big change in the society. If, if, if we look, if we look only 15, 20 years back, or when I came to Asia over 10 years ago, uh, Family values were. Ex I, I was impressed by these family values that that, that I uh, that I saw when I came over here. Family values are still big today. I'm not saying they, uh, they're small, 
But what has happened in the new, uh, in, in, with the new generation right now, so it's, it's more the individual values that count. It's the individual interests. So you see a lot of people, you probably see a lot more single people today than, than married people. It was in the old days, um, a, uh, the, ulti- the ultimate destiny for people to get married, to have a family. And, uh, uh, but n- nowadays, that value still stands. However, the personal interest comes first. So you see a lot of you know, men and women uh, going after their career, going after, well, starting with a, a good education, going after their career before they think about the family or, or their future in, in, a, in a family overall. Um, in Singapore, we see similar trends, um, but these trends have probably been, uh, they have developed earlier because Singapore was a mature market at a much earlier stage than China was. So this individual uh, development is, is, is pretty interesting. I'm curious to know whether in, that means that individuals have also become more vocal about the things they're concerned about, their willingness to speak to authority as is very, you know, Westerners do that with no reluctance at all, and they view the Chinese as somewhat reluctant to do that, and of course read in the media about punishment to those who take on the government. I sense that the Chinese government is listening to individuals who are speaking up, certainly when they do it in numbers. I I, I sense that that's one of the reasons that the fight against pollution has become a very public and and, um, important aspect of the of the government's activities can you can you talk about that yes so we, uh, it's, it's it's true what you're saying susan so so the, the 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 public opinion and the individual opinion uh might certainly vary overall uh, i think uh the individual i would say the young generation of chinese i, I wouldn't call them to be as outspoken with their public opinion as much as people are in the, in the western world simply because they they didn't grow up in that way uh, people certainly voice out concerns. People are very much, I wouldn't say they hide their opinion generally. People, people raise concerns in social media, something that, you know, in, in the Western world, uh, we, we, we can't really follow it uh, as much because a lot of it is in Chinese language. Uh, you see a lot of social media that is, that is still banned in China, You're looking at Twitter, Facebook, uh, um, uh, other social media, LinkedIn to some extent. Uh, so that's something that, that we usually can't follow or, or in, in only rare cases you see Chinese people uh, being very vocal about uh, their opinion uh, that is against the China government uh, generally. But I think, I think it, 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 it's more about, uh, it's more about uh, people basically raising their concern within their community. And that's not something that the China government uh, um, does not like to see. I think I, I when I first came to China, I, I, I was under the impression that people had to be really careful about their public opinion. I do see people certainly, you know, having critical words about uh, about their government when you meet with them over dinner in small groups. But that does not mean that you know they are uh, they are distancing themselves from their government. I think they do uh, they do understand, and many of them still in a lot of people in the. Uh, uh, a lot of intellectual people do support the views and the ideology of the um, of the China government, and still until today. And I would say I would still call those uh, the majority of the people. But that does not mean that they don't have any critical words, and they they necessarily agree with everything. So, how about Singapore, where being provocative is is also avoided, is it not? And the media is somewhat controlled. Do, is that still true? And does that have any relevance to? how things have changed over the last several years? Has that had any shift? Um, I, I think I have, honestly speaking, I've never felt that this had any disadvantage on me while I was here. The media is to some extent controlled here uh, in, in Singapore. So you see a lot of the, uh, the, the, the Singapore newspapers are state owned. So meaning they, they're controlled to some extent. But what, uh, unlike, unlike China, you have basically access to any international media uh, uh, outside uh, Sing- outside Singapore, so you have access to to basically all websites. I, there there are, there are possibly only a, f- a few areas that might be blocked. Uh, I, I couldn't even name them name you which ones they are, but uh, I think in Singapore, uh, an open opinion is uh, less of a challenge to the government than it probably is in China. But that again, that also has to do with the fact that of course Singapore is a small state. Singapore has out of the 
approximately 5 million people only, but 3.5 million are Singaporeans, and the rest are uh, foreigners that actually live within Singapore. So the environment generally is far more international than the domestic environment in China. Now, what about emigration? I, that's certainly true in China that some say some of the brightest and wealthiest are leaving the country. Uh, it, I, I assume that's not so true in Singapore, but do you have the... Do you have a sense of that when you when you uh, travel and work in China? Do you hear about that? Are a lot of people leaving, putting their money? As you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of investment going on in the West. Are they are they following their money here? Uh, a lot of people probably leave. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of people leaving China, but I've also seen a lot of people returning to ch back uh, uh, to China. Um, I think in the young generation, I think it's it's. Um, it's probably the dream to, to get uh, an education overseas simply because uh, it apparently adds a lot of value in the local environment to have that international exposure and especially you know, having international exposure coming back, let's say, working for, 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 for local big companies in, in, in China. This, uh, apparently, there, there's apparently a very big demand for this. Um, uh, seeing a lot of people, of course, leaving China uh, for good, that's a trend that we see, but uh, but if I compare this to Singapore, generally, I think that it's not a – Singapore is not uh, – you don't see a lot of Singapore's leaving their country. You see a lot more uh, people actually from the outside, from Southeast Asia, going into Singapore. But look at countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, or even Indonesia. So there, there, there is a stronger immigration coming into Singapore uh, than, than people leaving Singapore, actually. It's more of a magnet. Correct. So for, for, those, for those who remain in China – and some would say that uh, a crucial requirement now, maybe more crucial than ever, is that China needs to become and, and sustain innovation in order to solve the large size issues they have, like pollution, health care, and so on. I remember you're saying when we talked uh, about a year and a half ago that innovation is crucial in order for China to move successfully away from that earlier export model. And it's well into its way of doing that right now. Um, do you have some thoughts about this? Is China, in fact, besides the Alibabas and Tencent, are you seeing lots of innovation there? And if so, where is it coming from? So a lot, of, a lot of innovation that we see in China, uh, in China is really in the uh, in, in the e-commerce sector, where, as you mentioned, Tencent, Alibaba. There, there's a lot of innovation there. There's a lot of innovation in in. Uh, in the approach of uh, how, we, how people look at, uh, at the e-commerce e model. Now, if we look at innovation, we can look at technology, for example. So, so China has probably still a few years to go in terms of uh, innovation to be at the same level where, where North America, where the U.S. probably might be, where, where Western Europe might be. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a tr it's a trend that is, of course, very challenging because the, the global environment has become extremely competitive. Uh, China is not in the same situation like Korea was or Japan was a few decades back, where where the innovation was not innovation was not as transparent on the on, on in the global market as it probably is today. Um, China is bringing a lot of innovation into the country, and that is uh, through acquisitions, through through a lot of companies that it's acquiring, and when China acquires uh, corporations. It also acquires, in many cases, the IP that it probably tries to develop and tries to enhance uh, with its own people. So, on the other hand, what about the issue of innovation in Singapore? Uh, does Singapore even really need to be highly uh, innovative? It's a pretty happy place right now, pretty easy to manage with 4.5 million people, including uh, those who are foreigners working there. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, talent it comes in, attorneys, bankers, and so on that you need from elsewhere. Is innovation such a big issue in Singapore? It's uh, not an issue in Singapore, but there is less innovation overall. So uh, Singapore's main market is the service industries rather than, rather than uh, um, manufacturing or uh, the, yeah, the, the manufacturing industry. You do see some innovation and a lot of research and development being done in the medical industry and in the pharmaceutical industry here in Singapore. It's it's, it's a niche probably in a, from a from a uh, uh, from a domestic standpoint, but it is certainly it plays a, a, a very big role in the in the global market when it comes to innovation of new medical technologies, new new 
pharmaceutical development. So in that sense, Singapore does play a very, a very important role globally. But overall, in the service industry, it probably has less desire to be innovative uh, compared to China. And it seems to exist pretty well with that with that approach. The um, when you mentioned earlier the interest of the Chinese have in having their children educated in the West because of the prestige that that has, and also because of the difference, I guess, in the in the in the very approach to education that differs quite a bit from the West to the East. What what about the educational system? If that's going to be the source of innovation, if you need people who have been brought up that way, you can't educate everybody in the West. Is there? Do you, do you see that as a challenge to China? I know that Singapore has a first class educational system. I think you told me that your wife was brought up in Singapore. Do I have that right? And went to school there. She she was brought she was brought up in Singapore during her young age, but then also she went to school in Hong Kong and in Canada. Yeah. Ah, so she's got that multinational approach as well. So what about the educational system in China? Do you know anything about that, Axel? And is that something that you see uh, people are interested in shifting so that they can have their kids do less rote learning and more uh, innovative kind of thinking? I think, I think China's education system, and, and, and by all means, I have, I have an experience with myself, uh, I think still has gaps on, on uh, teaching its kids and students to be uh, really innovative. Uh, it is, it is. Uh, people say uh, Ch the China education system predominantly teaches you to be book smart rather than street smart. Um, so I think, as because of that, a lot of a lot of parents probably want to send their kids uh, overseas in order to have that innovative uh, thinking as you know part of them. Uh, making sure that it basically puts them ahead of this competitive environment where they're in, because because innovation is probably within the education system today, not something that that uh, China really uh, focuses on as much as it possibly should. So let me ask you about issues around privacy. As you know, people in the West are highly protective of their privacy, including all the data yes. about them. I mean, it's it's a really big deal here. I don't sense that that is so crucially important to the Chinese, and I, I don't know about the Singaporeans. Are there big differences in the privacy uh, uh, viewpoints or perspectives between Asia and the West? I think, I think privacy is a, a much more sensitive topic in the West than it is uh, in, in the East. Uh, in, in China, we hear a lot about it, that, that uh, uh, privacy laws, so there are no such privacy laws that actually uh, protect you as much as, as, as you have them in, in North America and, and in Europe. Um, we, see, we see in Singapore, you know, you, you see, of course, public areas being, you know, um, surveyed by CCTV cameras around the clock. Uh, it's something that, that uh, becomes a topic here and there generally, but I think a lot of people look at this in Singapore, for example, as more of a protective measure, basically that prevents crime. Uh, and uh, looking what the what the, the city or the state itself has developed over 50 years, it is really probably one of the countries with the lowest crime rates in the world, and that could be partly due to these uh, surveillances that that uh, the government puts in place. Now, this could be also possibly abuse uh, for, uh, against individuals' will, uh, but that's something that people are, in the public opinion, probably more appreciate. Um, now, if we look uh, if we look into China, now privacy certainly is a is, is a very big topic. People are aware of that. Uh, you, you you hear a lot about Big Brother watching you uh, without you knowing it. We see a lot in uh, in um, privacy issues now coming up in uh, um, in electronic data transfers where where there's no privacy given. Uh, we hear about people's email being hacked or being being uh, being surveyed. Now, that's a topic that generally, from my experience, is not a very big public topic, but it certainly is a challenge and possibly a problem in China. And probably more among the young. Absolutely, absolutely, because they are the generation that are using it predominantly. I think you still see you still see a gap in in uh, the older generations in China using technology. Um, they were not brought up with uh, with these technologies generally, so so it is definitely something that is uh, will be challenged eventually by the younger generation. 
So you're very, um, uh, the fact that you're still there in Singapore and working across Asia says to me that you have a, a real sense of optimism about the future in Asia, specifically China and Singapore. What is the biggest source of your optimism? Why is well, the, why is the op- the optimism the optimism uh, is 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 around the people I would have to say so people have a generally people in Asia have uh, uh, a very positively minded people uh, people try to look ahead rather than looking back I think that's something personally me for me that impresses me a lot so it's very often the attitudes to work it's about the attitude to solve the problem it's about uh, the attitude to overcome challenges so people are very much they have people have experienced. Uh, just in recent years or recent decades, what it actually means to have to 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 solve problems, to solve challenges. That's an attitude for me that it still impresses me every day. I don't see this everywhere in the West. Uh, uh, I see it predominantly a lot more in Asia. It's that hunger for knowledge. It's that hunger for understanding, uh, which which is something that really drives me. And I think that's something that that uh, is a very very strong base for Asia. Uh, to continue to grow over the next few years. I think your words are well chosen, the idea that there's hunger, there's an appetite for for improvement, a real sense of if I, if I work hard, if I do this, I will have a future. I think that's specifically Asian right now. Um, and so having said what about what you're optimistic, what will the major challenges be? What, where, where are the, the potential challenges to this positive future? But- so the challenges, uh, the challenges in Asia and, and predominantly in China will be, uh, obviously, the demographic sector. So if, if I look at China being a, uh, a country of almost 1.4 billion people today, uh, look, looking at, looking at uh, a fast aging population, China is going to run into a very, very big challenge where, where uh, by if I remember correctly, by, by, by 2025, uh, uh, about one-third of the population is going to be older than 65 years old, and that's going to be a, a significant challenge. Now, the, the young generation, basically, the, those are usually those are the kids of, of, the, of a generation that basically worked in factories, basically that worked hard. There was a lot of hard labor involved. Now, the, this generation is not in, in a position any longer to go back into the same steps, in the same footsteps where their parents are. They are hungry and they have a desire for a lot more. Now, the question really is, in a country with such a um, vast population, is there really room for everybody there? That's the big question mark, and those are the challenges I think that the government has to deal with. Well, I suppose, especially since China has now changed their one child per family rule to two children, uh, which I guess they had to do because they've been faced with this issue of so many old people with very few young people to care for them. That that will, however, exacerbate the demographic problem that you mentioned. So it's an interesting challenge. So Absolutely. Axel, are there other issues that you'd like to mention or that you think are particularly interesting regarding this whole East, East meets West um, uh, scenario? Anything that comes to your mind that you think is especially important? I think I think there's probably I think the environmental part is for is for China is is is, is a big challenge. So this is where China can only learn from the West uh, overall. I think uh, the the environmental challenges and problems that China is facing uh, um, there's uh, um, there are big pollution problems which will uh, eventually um, be seen in, in in health challenges a lot of people have. So that's something that 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 uh, China needs to look into. Um, we see we see we see uh, less of that in Singapore overall, uh, but overall I think pollution, environmental aspects uh, is something that uh, the East uh, has a lot of work to do on in, in, in order in order to get to that level where where North America and Europe is today. I don't hear the denial of the pollution problem though in Asia. Is there? I understand that that. Uh, it's a big issue, but you don't find people in government denying that it exists, do you? Uh, people don't ex- uh, people don't deny it, but I think uh, it's it's generally more of an avoidance in uh, in uh, in public talks that you see here in Asia. So it's not something which is prioritized generally uh, by governments or politicians. Uh, there are there are other problems that are being focused on. 
but it certainly is clearly visible. People do talk about it. People are concerned uh, overall, uh, and therefore it will remain a, a big challenge. So uh, is there any other issue that you'd like to mention regarding the East meets West scenario? Um, probably, we would probably have a lot more, but I think we've, we, we have more or less covered uh, the majority of the issues. Great. Well, thank you, Axel. It's been a delight to share your perspectives. Uh, Axel Herzhauser is Vice President Commercial uh, for Asia Pacific for Teleplan, which is a, uh, a company in the consumer electronics area based on the aftermarket uh, and all that involves with consumer electronics. Axel has more than 16 years of experience in the logistics and supply chain industry with more than 10 of them spent in Asia and the rest in Europe. He began his career in Germany before he came to Asia and established himself as a sought-after business executive uh, and really regarded as a supply chain wizard. Axel earned his uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Cooperative Education in Mannheim, Germany, and is currently based in Singapore. He speaks English, German, and some Cantonese, and because he's lived and worked in both Europe and Asia, Axel has an informed view of developments on both sides of the world, and I'm delighted that he shared them with us today, where he took part in today's conversation from Singapore in this session of East Meets West and Vice Versa series on curated conversations. I'm Susan Bird.